Um, thanks for being here for the Way of Gaia. Um, we are going to share screen. Um, Martin Bridge has some some uh, slides to share with you. And uh, I would like to welcome everybody for coming and thank you, thank our sponsors who are Rescue Poetics, Mary King, Kathy Cremens, the New England Grassroots Environment Fund, and we have help from SCORE, the Nature Imaginarium and Human Error Publishing. The festival is brought to you by Nature Culture, um, and I was honored to uh, publish this book, The Way of Gaia, and we are here with author Steve Tromulak, artist Martin Bridge, and forward writer, our headline speaker, John Davis. So I'm going to spotlight those three so you can see them and uh, they'll tell you more about what we'll do. Thank you. Hey everyone, thanks for coming to this session. Uh, as Lee said, in, in a sense, we're gonna be talking about the book, but also in the putting it into the context of its contribution to the larger theme of this gathering, online gathering of rewilding. And so it was a great pleasure in working on the book, which Martin and I'll talk about more in a little bit. It was a great pleasure to, to invite John Davis to write a forward to the book. Uh, John and I have, we, we go back many, many years to some of the, the early conversations that were going on and work that was going on in wildlands protection and designing a, a system of of wild lands that would protect life on earth. Um, and so it was a real treat to be able to reconnect with John, to engage him with, with my friend Martin to write this book, which is a combination of the visual arts and textual arts all in the service of protecting life on earth. So I think, uh, I think I'd like to begin with having John talk a little bit about the um, role that this book uh, plays in his thinking as a rewilding advocate, one of the, the foremost rewilding advocates in, in North America. So John, uh, why, don't, why don't you have uh, have some time here? Okay, thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> I'm so glad we reconnected through this book. I, I, I think about you often. You've been a great inspiration in my life. You're one of the few people I know who combines really skilled, eloquent, writing with hard science you do it beautifully and martin your art your art absolutely inspires me it's just gorgeous and i'm proud to be part of the book that you two have so beautifully put together <clears throat> and one reason why this was to to my mind very complementary to the other rewilding work i do is because i've realized through the years that although we want those of us in the rewilding community want our work to be scientifically informed and even scientifically guided. Science does not all that often change many minds, though there are some wonderful spokespeople in conservation biology like Steve and like our mutual friend Reed Noss and our late friend Michael Soule and, and others. <clears throat> Science, it, it, it actually does inspire me. It actually motivates me, but I don't think it changes all that many minds and hearts as we need to see happen if we are actually to accomplish our rewilding goals. I think art is more able to do that. Uh, again, Steve has an un unusual combination of science and art skills. His writing is art. Martin's paintings are superb art. And together, I think they, they create a picture of a, a wilder earth that I find highly compelling and motivating. And we, we need through art as well as science and, and through the humanities in general and through experiences with nature, we need to find the motivation to not just believe in uh, a wilder earth, not just believe in protecting wild places, but actually working toward that end. And I believe that the way of Gaia is a strong inspiration, a strong motivation for getting out there and helping save land, helping restore missing species, helping reconnect wild places across North America and beyond. So great work, Stephen Martin, very proud to be part of this effort. Well, thank you, John. Um, and thank you for the, the forward that you wrote because you really quite eloquently put the, uh, the, 
the shared work context front and center so that the entries in the book uh, don't just stand alone, but they have a meaning beyond uh, their individual representations. Um, so Martin, let's talk about the book. And why don't, why don't you start off by talking about who you are and yourself and, and um, start it all off. Okay. Well, I think uh, uh, this would be a fitting moment to actually uh, throw some art in front of our friends here. Uh, so as I talk, I'm going to share just a, a selection of images from the, the book. Um, so Steve and I <clears throat> had the pleasure of meeting uh, on a mountain in the dark by a fire about 25 years ago. And uh, for, for years, we kind of only knew each other as people who enjoyed uh, celebrating the sacred earth through uh, hanging out and making some noise. And as I started to, to learn about Steve's uh, professional work, um, that, uh, that drew me closer to him. And uh, I am a, a product of a family that is very deeply saturated in artists and nature lovers. And the, uh, the place that I feel most connected with uh, divinity, mystery, spirit has always been out in wild places. And I uh, am also a, a huge fan of uh, Joseph Campbell in terms of his, uh, his work in talking about mythology and, and the stories that connect us all. And I very early in, 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 in my development as an artist was struck by something he said in his interviews with Bill Moores in the Power of Mist series, where he was talking about the, the art forms of many indigenous cultures that were really more about trying to depict uh, an energy of an animal or an ecosystem. And, uh, and rather than the, the, the direct physical visage, because, you know, what, what can we what can we do as painters and, and drawers and other artists to tell the story of nature better than a camera can? Uh, not a lot often. So I figure I've tried not to mimic that in how I choose to portray and celebrate what I see in uh, the wild. But uh, working for years, there was a moment where uh, at another event, Steve uh, hosted a poetry slam called uh, Soul Expressions. And I was sitting next to, uh, well, kind of behind the circle. And I was just sketching and kind of uh, creeping on their conversation and their words and their stories. And, and there was a piece that he read one night that, that just really struck me to the core. And I, I was so moved that we were in a sort of, uh, a relaxed setting after the event. And I was like, hey, Steve, I think we should do a book together. You're writing my art. And that's that's uh, the moment that uh, the idea was, the seed was first planted, but it took a long time to, to gestate as both of us have professional careers as teachers and uh, a lot of other hobbies and things going on in our world. So it was uh, probably about a seven year process for us to uh, get to the, point that we did. And what was fun was that we, it began very organically. We created a list of things that we found were important elements and interactions in the ecosphere. And one of us would create a work of art in our medium and the other one would respond in theirs. And it went back and forth. So some of the, some of the pieces started with paintings that Steve found words that, that had a connection to, and many of them were uh, were his writings that I then created imagery that the, the words summoned for me. So it was a, a really interesting uh, flow from, from one piece to the other, and really only took shape uh, in terms of the structure and order in the very end of the, the process. So um, that's, a, that's a little bit about how we, how we uh, got the whole project started. And um, Steve, did you want to maybe share? Since since we've got the images running, do you want to share yeah. a meeting while they're going, or should I stop and 
No, no, no. You can. It's it's fine. You can keep the the images going. I want to I want to add a little bit of the history here from my perspective because um, you know I remember all those moments that Martin talked about quite clearly. My, you know, I'm a conservation biologist. I'm retired now, but I spent 35 years teaching conservation biology and environmental science at Middlebury College in Western Vermont, and. Uh, the the what Martin alluded to about being in the dark around a fire 25 plus years ago was my effort to try to integrate spirit into my practice uh, that was had already united science and advocacy, you know, the the science and advocacy, the hands and the mind. And I wanted to bring spirit into it and discovered Martin and a whole community of like minded people who felt that spirit lives in all beings. Um, the label we apply to ourselves or you know, we just say we're animists, but but essentially that's a broad way of saying it's not just humans that have spirit, uh, that all things have spirit. And my work started to expand to include more spoken word. Um, I write poetry, spoken word poetry and prose, and mostly perform that. But when when Martin approached me, you know, in his telling, it's like, hey, Steve, let's do a book. He didn't know that at the time that he asked that, I had already been kicking around in my head the idea of a book that was, in my initial thinking, was not related to art, but was really trying to tap into the deep power of words to motivate change. And the the inspiration for that was Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, where I'd often remarked to my students that it was amazing that a book that is over two millennia old, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's historical uh, debates about whether Lao Tzu was one person or many or existed at all and what the date was of the initial writing. But we do know it. it is a central text that has survived millennia and is probably one of the most widely printed and translated books in the world, not just in China, but in the world. And I have always been struck by how it motivated uh change it it motivated the ability of people to focus on uh rightness but i also noted that it largely deals with human human relationships there, there's to my eye more vague connections between the the entries the 81 entries in the book to um nature or the universe but it's really about how people should view themselves and how they should get along with others. And it, it's been argued that the book was really written for trying to have the leaders be better leaders. And I thought, wouldn't it be great in this time, in this time of the Anthropocene, this time of dramatic human modification of the planet and, and bio erosion, you know, the, the mass extinction and the changing of the climate and, you know, we're, we're here talking about rewilding, and it's only a topic that we need to talk about because of how unwild the world has become. And I said, wouldn't it be nice if there was a book that really spoke to the modern era, uh, that that did what Lao Tzu did with the Tao Te Ching, but did it for the Anthropocene? And when Martin approached me with the idea of doing the book, uh, doing such a book with him, it resonated quite strongly. And that's that's where this all came about. It emerged from that initial seed. M Martin said, we, we made a list of topics. Um, we wanted every entry in the book to be related in some meaningful way to ecology, evolution, or the environment so that it spoke to the larger issue of humans' relationship with the more than just human world. And there are 44 entries in the book. Each entry is, is accompanied by at least one, in some cases, many of Martin's paintings, which, as he said, 
he worked on over a seven year period. And uh, each entry involves at least some text that I worked on over a seven year period that takes the form of either uh, poetry, prose, or prayers. All of the the sort of styles that I that I like to write in. And we started whittling it down. It was, you know, it was completely collaborative. And and I'm a I'm a now a true believer in the not only the the inter the importance of integrating the arts and sciences, but doing it in a collaborative way. So it's not just expecting each person to be both an artist and a scientist, but to to have a cross pollination of ideas and ways of representing critical ideas. So I made a huge list of, you know, essentially it was a syllabus of every course I've ever taught at the college and Martin and I whittled it down. Some of his paintings, he was painting in reaction to a particular word on the list. And then I would write text for some of the entries. I would write text and Martin would paint like this hummingbird that you're seeing is a painting whose original origin was a response to a piece that I had written Martin did that painting and then I revised the piece and then Martin revised the painting. So it was a, it was actually a, a dialogue between us that went on for quite some time. So some of the entries are, uh, have their origin as a word like magnetism or uh, pollination or predation or uh, movement, earth's movements like earthquakes and, and whatnot. Uh, and then Martin would paint, I would write, and then the entry was complete. Some of it was I would write, Martin would paint, the entry was complete. And then, like I said, some of it was back and forth. I, I'm under no illusion that Martin and I will be remembered two millennia from now as having developed the the, the Tao Te Ching for the Anthropocene. But we we do believe that the title of the book we we meet, it's a heartfelt belief that the title of the book is how we intended it. it's it's the way of gaia it's it's the way we have to live with the earth and um yeah i i highly recommend it uh actually i'm going to martin can i share some, uh, share a screen you may have to turn yours off i'm going to throw up just what am I going to put up this so that those of you that say, wow, I really like what they're saying. This is the cover of the book and the blurb. Uh, as we said before, the nature culture is the publisher of the book and it came out earlier this year. Um, it's blocked on my screen, uh, but this, the, the, the way to get to the website for the book is either directly through nature cultures website or uh, through uh, the way of the way of Gaia org, and uh, you can see more of Martin's paintings. You can see some testimonials from people like Bill McKibben on the the uh, meaning of the book for the the current efforts that we're making at uh, protecting and restoring life on Earth. Um, yeah, so I've lost track of time. Um, may, I, may I add one point, Steve? Please, yeah. So in in the in my foreword, which I was proud to write for this beautiful book, uh, I paraphrase my one of I've lost too many of my teachers in recent years, but one of them uh, was Doug Tompkins, great wildlands philanthropist, who said, and he's been quoted on this quite a bit. If I see, if there's if there's any one thing that could save the world, I'd put my money on beauty or something along those. Not the exact words, but basically, he was extolling beauty as what can motivate people to want to save our wondrous planet. So beauty and wonder, I think, really come out in this book throughout, in the writing, in the paintings. And, and I think that's how, that is a crucial way to motivate people to actually take the actions needed to rewild Earth. Yeah, that's great. And and thanks for remembering that, that quote from Doug. Um, one of the things that I think will help motivate people is the structure of the book where we, we didn't write it as one long narrative. 
where you start at chapter one and get to chapter 12 and then read the epilogue, each entry stands alone. And in talking with people about the book, taking it to different festivals and, um, you know, direct sales to, to people that come up to us and say, I, you know, I'd like to buy the book. The invitation that I've made to each person that has gotten the book from me is let me know what resonates for you. You know, what entry speaks to you and, and why is that? And I hear back from a number of people, many different people about this. And what has struck me is that, um, well, one, their responses are deeply felt. I mean, tears in their eyes about something that struck them. But the other thing is, is that everybody's resonating at, at on a different entry. There's no one punchline that motivates and that 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 someone says this is the wonder this is the beauty it's all it's different and being able to to put together something that has the the power the possibility of connecting with people wherever they are wherever they are internally um has been uh, quite a gift. And it was something that I hadn't predicted. You know, when I when I first put together the list and Martin and I were sort of thinking about the sequence of things, I think probably naively I was thinking about it in a in a sort of a linear way. That's not how it's being read. And and I love that. Um taking a look at the time, might we have time for a reading? Yes, definitely. You had um, thought maybe a half hour for questions starting at two, so there's plenty of time for reading. Okay. Um, I'm going to read one that that actually, to to me, is is sort of the motivate or it, it represents the 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 greatest collaboration that Martin and I had. It was his painting at a, a spoken word session that then resulted in me modifying what I had been reading, which led to him modifying the painting and so on. And it actually speaks to the idea of poetry itself. And in some ways I think is reflective of this uh, a and gathering, which, which has been marvelous so far. And I'm glad all of you were here. And so you can imagine Martin's painting about a uh, hummingbird. This is called the butterfly effect. So <clears throat> there's this poem by Taylor Molly, and I want to tell you about how it changed my life. The story can be told in two ways. There's the long version and the short version, and the long version goes something like this. So there's this poem by Taylor Molly called The Problem. That's not one of his funny, sarcastic, yeah, I've so been there poems about teachers making and writers writhing and speakers speaking, you know, like badly. The problem is one of those B-side poems that never made it onto YouTube or into the spotlight because it lacks the kind of high-minded flair that lets it kill when the stage is hot and the best has been brought and each voice burns as if on fire. The problem is a simple poem about Molly trying to get on a train in New York City and he can't because the guy in front of him won't move. But Molly sees that the guy in front of him is not the problem. He's my problem, Molly says, but he's not the problem. The problem is the guy further up the line who won't step aside to let anyone pass and becomes the wellspring of cascading problems flowing back along the line, turning the platform, train, and people into a complex system whose behavior is totally screwed by that one guy, the problem, who makes everyone else someone else's problem. It's a good poem and you should read it sometime, but that's not why I'm telling you this story or how it changed my life. I'm a teacher, you see, and not in some vague metaphysical sense. I have real students who pay real money for me to teach them something they could not learn on their own, even if they bothered to read the textbook. I get paid to help them see what's really in front of them. 
So the other day I was teaching this class about the environment and the fate of the world and how their generation must do better than mine, but everything is connected to everything else and seeing the right lever, solution or incantation means you have to see what's really going on. Consider this, the solution to pollution in Lake Baikal may in fact not be another wastewater treatment plant, but instead may be an easing of ethnic conflict in Nigeria because of the chain of effects that ripple out from Africa like oil through pipelines, banks, and backroom deals. It's about the connections between the seafood sold by Walmart and deaths in Thailand when tsunami waves crush mangrove stripped villages. It's about the connections between clear cutting in Ecuador and drought in India, between gold mining, nutrition, and health, between energy, babies, and clean water, between cars, coal, and asthma, between the beat of a butterfly's wings and everything. Each of our lives and tribes are enmeshed in a web so complex in time and space that minds can only contain it all by calling it Mother Earth and emoting metaphorically about her as if she were a single thing rather than the dynamic, chaotic ball of nonlinear loops she really is. And that is so hard to teach. I show PowerPoint slides repeat with six colored graphs on AIDS in Uganda and salt in fields of Australian wheat rates of extinction and the rise of everything from CO2 concentrations to suicide rates to cancers in children who live in the wrong part of town. And it's like I'm speaking in tongues, a language for my students that is completely unknown and completely unknowable. And it breaks my heart. So anyway, one day before the start of class, I decided, well, what the hell, I'll read a poem. I bring poems to poetry circles. Why not to my science class, right? I read The Problem. It's a good poem. I like it, they like it, we move on. Days later on a field trip to a local park, I'm walking behind two of my students, eavesdropping in that silent way that teachers do to learn what they are really thinking and not just what they want you to think they're thinking. And one says to the other, I don't get the reading. First, it's about Antarctica melting, and then it's rivers flooding in Asia, polar bears dying, and third world debt. I don't see what the point is supposed to be. And the other says, dude, it's like that poem. Don't just look at a problem. Look for the problem. The guy in the subway who won't step aside. Silence ensues. And finally, the first one says, no, I get it. Earth is the subway. It's a system. And you have to find the problem to make a change. And finally, after all these years, after all the six colored graphs and 10 column tables, the spreadsheets, worksheets, peer reviewed papers, problem sets, mock debates, clickers and classrooms flipped upside down, and inside out, because of poetry, I have finally taught somebody, somebody something. So that's how a poem changed my life. A poem is more than just an invitation to enjoy a brief bit of syncopated wordplay. A poem is a window, a doorway, a Rubik's cube right on the edge of being solved and showing a whole new way to see the world. And now I will always start my classes with a poem. Because that's how a poem changed their lives. They're now really looking, really looking to find the problems. And maybe, just maybe, a poem will change your life. Because those two students, or ones just like them, may one day save the world. So that's the long version of the story. And the short version goes something like this. You are a butterfly. Be mindful of how you beat your wings.
Thanks. So I think uh, Martin and I and John would be very happy to uh, answer any questions that people might have for us. Well, uh, maybe while we sort through, I would love to actually just drop one little piece in response to that. That that poem uh, was one that really struck me. And uh, years ago, Steve had invited me to do a residency with the uh, the Middlebury School for the Environment. And in, in talking about that and being there, Steve voiced the importance of finding the narrative that's going to speak to someone, right? And uh, John earlier mentioned that, you know, like uh, most people don't pay attention to science except for scientists or, or something. I'm paraphrasing. I, I forget exactly what he said. But as as we start to reach out as advocates, we got to find different inroads and different things are going to catch someone's attention. Some some of it may be a writing or an image. And there's a story I share about one of the one of the greatest examples that I've seen in my work of of how uh, an image can be an introduction to a conversation that can change someone's life where uh, I was at an event where I was working on a portrait of one of my one of my heroes, uh, the, the renowned mycologist Paul Stamets. And some guy came up to me and uh, he he was he he was looking over my shoulder. He's like, hey, man, who is that? Is that Jerry Garcia? And I was like, no, dude, <laughs> not Jerry Garcia. He's like, well, who is it? And this is there's noise and chaos and people around. And I and I just like, well, it's Paul, uh, Paul Stamets. And he's like, who's that? And I was like, He's a mycologist. And and then he's like, well, what does that mean? Study of mushrooms. And then he was basically like, well, what's so what's so cool about that? And I and I gave him my 30 second elevator pitch. And then I ended it and I said, hey, I'll be back teaching an intro workshop here in April. I'd love to see you there. He's like, I might do that. And that that individual came, sat through, you know, and, uh, you know, hour and a half uh, lecture and demo on uh, cultivation. And um, years later, I got an email from this guy and and he's actually gone far further with uh, cultivation and, and uh, than I have because I've you know got a day job and an art habit and, and uh, that cut into to my time on that kind of stuff. And it just to me, it was striking where, you know, the if we approach someone and grab them by the, the collar and shake their neck and say, you need to think this and believe this and do this. Um, many people are going to, if what we're saying doesn't already fit within their mindset, it, it can be off-putting. So we sometimes have to find the gentle bait to hook people in, uh, through imagery or words that then establishes a emotional connection with what we're trying to communicate before they can fully engage. And, um, so that, that, that poem was one of the ones that struck me as an importance about why we're doing what we're doing in the way that we did it. Mm. Yeah, well said. Those are great stories. So um, now's the time when anybody can ask a question. Um, if you would just raise your hand and uh, we'll answer them in order and ask you to unmute to ask your question and then remute. Thank you. And you can also put them in the chat if you're feeling um, shy. While we're waiting for for questions to come from the audience, Martin, I have a quick question for you. How has working on this project with me affected your art? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um. Well, let me let me answer it slightly differently than than what, what you're at. Um, what I th so one of the things that I I uh, as someone who was a nature lover who then felt passionate about trying to find a way to to uh, ref to to change my relationship with the web of life. I stumbled upon, uh, I had a chance walk in the woods where I was both introduced to the work of Paul Stamets and uh, Bill Mollison, uh, the, the 
originator of the permaculture concept. And that became really impactful in, in how I started to try to take physical action to reflect my, my, uh, my feeling or reverence for the, the earth. And, and so I, in the process of working on this book, I, I feel that I actually learn more sort of less about the, the physical artwork, like the painting and the expression in that way, but thinking more about my work as a, a teacher and an advocate and, and now someone who's helping to spread permaculture practices and inspire others and, and how I interact with my property, uh, the, my homestead Ardor, which I is sort of like, uh, trying to create a, you know, a, a model site for temperate climate permaculture strategies. And so it's, it's less about how the work has impacted my, my painting and more about my artistry of this land that, that I consider to be one of my, my sort of great opuses uh, in terms of the, the structure and the landscaping and the, the integration of sort of sacred architecture on the landscape as well as intensely practical uh, food forest design. So uh, that's been that's been something that's that's been probably the most impactful about that. Just getting to have an excuse to pick Steve's brain more than I normally do when <laughs> lugging firewood or setting up things at the events that we we tend to cross paths at. Yeah. So, John, can I, can I throw a similar question at you? You sure. you quoted Doug Tompkins about the importance of beauty. How does any of that your exposure to Martin's work or my words uh, affect how you think about wildlands advocacy and the rewilding work and the importance of getting beauty into the eyes of people who need to manifest the change? Yeah, I think we in the conservation community need to incorporate the arts much more than we have. Poetry, painting, music, is our mutual friend, Steve, our mutual friend, David Johns, has been saying for years, no movement has been successful without music. Hasn't been, you know, probably no music and no movement has been successful without dance, without painting, without all the, the full range of arts. And we just don't have enough of that in the conservation community. We tend to be scholarly and uh, you know, motivated certainly motivated and, and and intelligent and knowledgeable, but we not enough of us are artists. So I think one way the way of Gaia, one, one thing the way of Gaia did for me is remind me I should be talking with artists more. I should be trying to I when I talk to young people, I whenever I get a chance, I'll talk to young people at colleges or universities and I often urge them try to get try to get positions with the wildlife and land management agencies. We urgently need to make those agencies more ecologically minded. But I should probably also be telling them, get take up an art, take up an art form. If you can make a living as an artist, more power to you. That's very difficult. But at least have, as a, how did you put it there, Martin? As, um, you have a, ha a art habit. <laughs> Everybody should have an art habit, I think. And and I think we will move people more that way. And I think art is just a beautiful way of expressing our love for wild nature. I actually like to fancy that I have an art form myself, but it's, a, it's it's debatable whether it really is an art form. And that art form is exploring wild nature. I like to make nice lines through wild places, in a sense, exploring and getting to know them, whether that's really art or not, of course, is a, another matter. But I think that art really does motivate people and we need to incorporate it much more into our work. And maps, by the way, maps can be, I think, a beautiful form of art. Not, not so much those digital ones with all the, all the polygons, but hand-drawn maps showing where the wild creatures may be wanting to move and where the ideal wild cores and wildlife corridors can be. Those th those can be works of art, too, I believe. John, I, I, I actually, what you said reminded me, one, one of the fortunate things for me is that I, I've been working at a school that was sort of founded on uh, the you know, Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences and and then also looking at uh, our original goal was to kind of break down some of the divisions between different disciplines in education. And so how do we integrate uh, the performing arts and visual arts with 
with more standard science or 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 history or or uh, uh, writing work. And I had the luck of I got a, I had a, a significant amount of time where I was able to explore and work with the founder of the environmental science program, who actually happened to base his thesis on Steve Trombilak's work here. Um, mm -hmm. I told him I was friends with him. He kind of lost his his uh, stuff. Uh, but we a lot of people lose their stuff when they hear my name. Let me let me uh, tell you. That. He's like, what? You know Steve Trombilak? <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, and uh, but we we got to to spend a lot of time exploring interconnections between art and environmental science. And some of the things that I found that were really the most impactful is like, if you're studying an environment, you can't just go out there and like, okay, I'm gonna name all the species and I, oh, I've identified everything and I understand what's there, right? It takes time, it takes a lot of time and the discipline to sit down and draw, uh, the time it takes to create a work of art, uh, it, it teaches a different way of, of being and exploring a subject, whether it's a species or a landscape, uh, and it changes the way in which we 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 look at those things. Um, you know, and on a pragmatic level, we also would do like life drawing exercises, and you know, kids are like, "Well, what's that?" And I'm like, "Well, well, take a look," you know, and and uh, kind of looking at how intrinsically form and function are linked in evolution. And you know, I love uh, as a prep for the the exercise, sometimes like pulling up a picture of a a, a mallard and a you know a a common Marangancer, right? Um, and uh, and to, to many young students, they look very similar. Like, and I'm like, look closely. And and uh, you know, we, we only have this one image. We don't have the opportunity to like watch it and know all these things about it. But what can we tell? And when we zoom in on the beak, and suddenly like, wait, this one's sharp and it's got serrations, and and this one's flat. I'm like, well, what do you think? <laughs> Why do you think? And I was like. Is that one a fish? Is is it a fishing bird? And uh, so, like that that kind of investigation into what what we're seeing, I think, is a great different way rather than just giving people texts that explain what this species does. It enhances curiosity, it enhances depth of thinking. So, I I'm I'm a big proponent of yeah, more artists should sorry study science so they under you know understand uh, you know whether you're, if you love drawing people understand anatomy so you know why we're shaped the way we do uh we, we are excuse me um and or if you know you're into uh nature you know understand what you're representing and so you can bring a little more to, to the image than just just the physical visage and so um anyway yeah the, the visual the importance of, of visual engagement with the world we live in is really critical. It's how you go from being someone who's just existing at a place to being an inhabitant and a neighbor of everything that's there. I get, I'm going to get his exact words wrong, but Gary Snyder had a, a great essay in his book, The Practice of the Wild, where he made the he contrasted being an inhabitant and being a colonist. And an inhabitant, you know, somebody who lives in a place, lives with more than just the the people next door. Uh, they they live with everything else that is there, all the other people, the the non human people, and uh, you 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 don't come to understand or appreciate that without being visually or, or sensually aware. It's not just vision; it's smell and touch and taste and and. Uh, sound and John, John to your point about maps um, you I don't know if you will remember this this not incident but the the basic narrative back in the 90s when we were doing visioning workshops mm -hmm. for the wildlands project I think it was Jamie Sayan who who said in advance of one of the meetings is come with maps you know, the, the person with the maps controls the narrative of mm. the meeting. That's if right. you all just walk in and say, well, I think rewilding is important. And I really think we need to protect wild nature. That only goes a very short distance. But if you put down a map, a visual representation of what the landscape could look like, if we only um, break a sweat and, and do the advocacy work, then... Uh, that yeah. that's when the motivation will, will 
be going or yeah. the, the, mo the momentum will build up. I agree. So I'd add a point if there's not a question booming right away. Um, movement, I, various of us have said many times that movement is as essential to life as earth, air, fire, and water. Your book, both the words and the images really convey the movement, the vitality, the the connectivity, the connections between various elements within Gaia. And I, I love that. The movement is is critical and you convey that so well. Yeah, thank you. Ah, yeah, there's the butterfly effect. You you are the butterfly. Be mindful of how you beat your wings. I mean that, John. That point about movement. One of the things, if you really look at all of Martin's paintings, there is movement in it. Yeah. There's nothing static, and even if the image looks like a frozen moment in time, like um, the chrysalis, where the the caterpillar is doing its metamorphosis thing it the there is visual implication there that it's not just an isolated moment but it's it's one cell from uh, a movie and you can almost see the movie play out and part of the environmental crisis that we find ourselves in as i think society has viewed nature as being static it it can't respond to what we do we can you know cut down trees and that will have no effect on how the air moves or animals migrate and we can pollute the seas and that has no effect on coral reefs or or climate it's it's a it's a dynamic world we live in and and i think martin's painting and things that i wrote to accompany it highlight that dynamism or maybe not highlight but try to make sure that people understand that nature is dynamic there's one entire entry just simply on movement and highlighting the movement of air of fire even in you know below the earth's crust the movement of the magma and the movement of oxygen molecules across the membranes of our cells we're all moving there are um, a few comments in the chat. Uh, yeah. Joan writes, bravo for advocating connections with everything, especially the arts. Uh, she's a poet, so there you go. <laughs> uh, John writes, I get paid to help them see what's really in front of them. And I'm a huge fan of the quote, the best teachers show you where to look, but not necessarily what to see. Steve, bringing poetry into your classroom is an amazing way to introduce expanded and more complex thinking. What are other ways you each could speak to in encouraging complex thinking and connection in the classrooms and beyond, including this book? Thank you. Yeah, well, engaging. I mean, I was just in a session here at ANA in the hour before this and uh, one of the presenters was talking about her work in a science class where she was having the students produce art and the art was emerging from their work on on watershed science so it you know Martin can speak about this much better than I can, but I imagine that if you're in the process of creating something visual, you have to think about it much more deeply than if you're just reading words on a page. So an act, something active that is visual or kinetic, uh, I think uh, would contribute to that goal. Martin, what, what do you think? Well, I, I'm, it's, it's funny as you're talking, I'm looking at the images that are that are uh, behind both of you, John and, and Steve. Uh, the the piece behind Steve, you know, one of the things that I look at, you could look at it and it you could look at it as a, a hydro, you know, hydrological cycle, right? Um, uh, and at the same time, you know, that 
I think about how many, you know, line drawings of, of, of the, those, you know, whether it's the carbon cycle or the water cycle that you see in science textbooks that, you know, feel so dry and are just like trying to separate <clears throat> so many things that are overlapping and related, you know, and so, uh, some of some of it is just you know layering complexity in there to to recognize that sometimes we try to we try to look I mean, our our human sight is so limited in terms of looking at how the the complexity of environmental interaction yeah. and we try to look at a manageable chunk and in that we lose something i think sometimes and just the reminder that there's way more going on than we can look at or see at any one time, right? A little bit of what was, what's, what's a problem where, what's the problem, you know, the, those challenges, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, uh, and I, I, it's one of those things where I've seen some artists who uh, promote them, their work is bridging realms of science and art, and sometimes they do it really well. And sometimes it's just like, oh, they're slapping that label on to make it seem deeper than it is. And and I and I, you know, I I struggle sometimes with knowing, you know, like, is this actually achieving anything? I mean, we never know. Like when we're when we're when we're creating something new, how it's gonna land with an audience and whatnot. Is this gonna be cheesy? Is this actually gonna communicate what I'm trying to do? Um, so it's an exploration. And uh, you know, I uh, the the piece that's behind John is actually the the one that essentially forged my my first connection with uh, with uh, our our publisher um, in in I'm forgetting the title of the anthology that that was used in uh, but it was it became the starting point of a, a much greater collaboration but it's just you know the the piece is titled photosynthesis and you might I don't know if you picked up on this but there's you know text running around the the border of the leaf, which is just, I mean, I, I did it in Roman numerals and whatnot, but it's just the chemical e equation for photosynthesis, you know, spelled out <laughs> uh, and turned into a decorative motif, right? Um, and, you know, some people pick up on it, some people don't. And I like that it feels a little mystic and because, uh, I mean, photosynthesis is straight up magic and one of the most amazing <laughs> things that I mean, obviously has led to the complexity of life on our planet. If that hadn't been one of the early processes, we, we wouldn't be here, you know? Uh, yeah. uh, I'm going to add another response to the question about helping uh, encourage complex thinking. So the, the piece that I read, the butterfly effect, that's actually a true story. It, it really happened, but I'm being a little bit, cavalier and saying I always bring a poem to my class what I actually do is I start the semester by bringing a poem to the class but make it really clear that we would begin class with a poem but I want the students to start stepping in and bringing a poem and uh, it takes about a week two weeks for for people to really get into it because I would then begin every class by saying okay who brought one well, nobody. Well, I guess I'll read, you know, and I would always have one. But eventually people start bringing pieces that mean something to them. And almost always those pieces relate to the theme of the course, in particular environmental science. And I have to believe that the process, uh, the, the process that a student goes through to select a poem and to think about how to read it in front of people um, deepens their thinking and their, their creativity, their engagement about the complexities of what we're dealing with. They're, they're actively becoming creative and, and engaging with the arts as they engage with the science. All right, Lisa's given us the three minute warning here. So if you've got questions, this is a good time. I'm retired, so you can always find me, but but Martin, he's a busy guy, so you should connect with him here. The anthology Martin mentioned is uh, Honoring Nature, which we he was gracious enough to let us use photosynthesis for the cover. And uh, that was an anthology from the first two Authors and Artists Festivals, actually. 
And um, so thank you, Martin, especially for um, letting us use all your beautiful artwork for the covers. I mean, people pick up the book and it, anything could be in it, but <laughs> they see the cover and they're like, wow, it's beautiful. I'm like, <laughs> it's not to do with me. It's to do with Martin. But um, I just wanted to sneak that in there while we were talking about the art. Thank you. Yeah, I second that. I'm not a published poet except for having some words that accompany Martin's paintings. <laughs> I, I love that I have a small section of my, my one of my, I guess part of my library in my studio is just all packed with <laughs> book after book uh, with uh, my art slapped on the cover thanks to uh, Lisa and uh, authors and artists. Yeah. And we feel really lucky to be able to use it. And I think it really does bring people in to the message for the, the writing the land um, uh, anthologies are all about land conservation. And, um, and our next, our next uh, session is with From Root to Seed, Black, Brown and Indigenous Poets Write the Northeast. And on that cover, is um the barn owl or in mm -hmm. that uh so that that one has also benefited from from being associated with with all of you guys so i thank you so much for taking the time to share all this with us oh, and um if people want to be in touch why don't you put the um Put the uh, website for the Way of Gaia into the chat again uh, so they can find the entire book because it really, I think, came out beautiful. But then again, I'm biased. <laughs> I will confirm it turned out beautifully. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, okay, so we need a couple minutes to switch over. So yeah. I'm going to uh, let you guys go and thank you so much for everything you're doing. Um, Thanks, Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, John. Thanks. 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 Beautiful Thanks, work. John. Martin, Thank you. Lisa. An honor.